Okay. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm very happy that I'm talking with uh, Richard. And this interview is going to be different from the previous ones because we talk about science and like research and writing about science. Now, this uh, interview is going to be more about how to do science, but uh, with the help of uh, computational tools. Before getting into this conversation, I, I, I want to tell this because it was like a very personal experience and a story which I believe a lot of people uh, can relate. And the story is that I started my career in physics and then I got my PhD in computer science at Aalto University in Finland. So my career was basically designed in a very classic way that you need to know a lot of mathematics and then you know some physics and then you learn them together and then you are done. But I started my master's program in physics of complex systems and I had to do a lot of programming. And I only had one or two courses in programming in C++ in a very bad way. And then I realized that I need to do a lot of computation, which they should be efficient because we didn't have that much of resources. And uh, there were so many other things around that, that I had no proper training, like uh, how should I keep my code updated? How should I have a backup? Like how should I share it with other people? And it was worse and worse because there was no proper training for me as someone who came to programming from like a scientific perspective. And when I came to Alto as like a PhD student, uh, well, they call it doctoral researcher. The problem was even worse because I was in an environment that they were really good programmers because they were trained from day one to be programmers. And uh, then there were people like me who were doing interdisciplinary projects, but we were severely lack a good training. And more than that, we lack the courage of asking questions because these questions are somewhat stupid when you ask from like a senior programmer. And at the same time, you're in a research team that you need to do a lot of stuff and neither you nor the supervisor have enough time to do all the training or all the infrastructure. However, I was very lucky at Alto because there was a team called Science IT and Richard was one of the guys uh, regulating the whole thing that they let us do our research and ask them questions whenever we need it. And also they provided us a very nice friendly environment so that me as a researcher didn't have to think a lot about my issues, which were not directly related to my research. And today I ask uh, Richard uh, to join us for this conversation because I believe that my time at Alto was a great time. And a lot of that is because of what Richard and his team done. Uh, so very happy that to have you here, Richard. Welcome. Hi, thanks but, for having me. Uh, so to begin with, I know that you're also not coming from like a very programming uh, type of background. Can you tell us about how you started your career in science and how you shifted to yeah. what you're doing now? Yeah, well, whenever people ask what I've studied, I say I started my bachelor's studying chemical engineering. Mm -hmm. By the, in the middle of it, I switched to chemistry. PhD started in chemical physics. By the end of that, I was poking around at community detection, which continued when I started a postdoc, which transformed into more network science and data science things. So basically, I'm nothing because I haven't studied any one thing enough. But what ha does combine all these things together is I've always used computing to do it. So they've always been sort of computational. That's been my specialty, so to say. I should say you didn't hear anything about computer science or programming in there. Basically, mm -hmm. all the computer stuff I've learned myself, which is good and bad, I guess, but it just is how it is and pretty common for many people. And actually, for most people on my team, that's a fairly common thing. But mm -hmm. anyway, so um like even chemical engineering moved yeah. to network science finish your phd did a postdoc and mm -hmm. then you switch to more 
of not being a, a scientist per se. Right. Yeah. So then around 2016 or so, I made a transition having an academic job where I was evaluated in terms of publishing paper papers. I joined the team called Science IT, or as we call it now, Alto Scientific Computing, unofficially. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the team which I'll tell all about in the upcoming hour, I guess. Yeah, but so the team was there and you joined it, or you basically, you were hired and you start building the team. The team was there. So uh, it started around 2009 as a combination of um the applied physics biomedical engineering and computational science and information computer science department basically it started as a team whose job was to run the local high performance computing cluster and then slowly over time as we'll talk about later it's adapted to this full package support of research instead of support of the usage of computers mm -hmm. So since 2016, you are there. Yes. And, uh, so and what are your roles and responsibilities now? Yeah, let's see. So I, when people ask this, it's hard because I do so many things that I almost do nothing. But I can roughly divide into three main categories. One is the cluster support and, and maintenance. So basically the system administration of the high-performance computing cluster. And this is not really a big part of my job. So it's what I started doing because that's mostly what our team was doing in 2016. But these days I do very little, except for example, during the summers when I'm the ones here, when I'm the one here and I can um, keep it running while many other people are on vacation. Mm -hmm. So okay, that's one, which is the traditional high performance computing admin um, stuff. Second is there's teaching. And well, Abbas talked about some of these courses. Um, and I think we'll talk more about them later. But basically, um, I'm one of the teachers there. I'm not really the coordinator of the teaching that much. Um, I've done a lot with the latest teaching strategies, like stream courses and things like that. Um, I'm our connection to the Code Refinery project, which is a Nordic project for sharing, teaching, and running workshops, which I guess we'll also talk about later. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's the second one, teaching. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, oh, yeah. How many people you have in total officially in your team? Hmm. I think we're at 13 now okay. with many of these people shared among several different teams and projects Okay, that we've grown a lot. So in 2016, when I started, I was person number five at the time. Mm. So it's grown Yeah, more than, well, I guess. Yeah. I guess if it was four people back then before I joined and now it's 13, that's three times growth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you have any new member in your team, which is kind of very unexpected now, when you look from back, that you didn't expect to have that role in your team or for like uh, university administrators? I mean, I guess the whole research software engineering addition was probably unexpected at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, looking back, it sort of makes sense because we sort of always had this mindset of, supporting the users, like don't leave people alone. Mm -hmm. But yeah, let's get to that later. Yeah, so now but, so you kind of maintain the hardware, yeah. you do the teaching, and you are also doing the user research. Uh, the the, the oh, user yeah. support. Yeah, yeah. You have yeah the, that's the third one. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I'm the research software engineer team we've had, which is responsible for about half of the growth of the team. Actually, most of the growth of the team since I joined. Um, and this team is basically the people that, they aren't cluster admins, but they really are the, whatever the research needs, we do it. 
And I wish I could do more of that, but a lot of my time is spent on other things and keeping the whole research software stuff organized and going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Okay, let, let's then uh, get uh, get to each of them separately. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in terms of uh, infrastructure, do you want to like give us some sort of introduction to the like facilities that Alto has in terms of hardware, like Yeah. computational for like computational resources, like cluster servers or whatever we have at Alto? Yeah. So we have a pretty standard looking high performance computing cluster. Actually, I guess I should say this is what my team does. Alto has other resources like smaller workstations and things like that, the typical IT stuff. I won't talk about that because it's not really relevant or interesting. But our local computing cluster is a pretty standard Slurm high-performance computing cluster. It has something like uh, two or 300 computing nodes in it, of which it has, I think, around 10,000 processors and 250 or 300 GPUs, which sounds like a lot. But in the scale of the really big worldwide clusters, it's not that big. It is large on the scale of a... cluster dedicated to one university um, where in a country where we have other good national resources. Mm -hmm. So this is like Triton. Yes, this is the Triton cluster. Yeah. And uh, well, I should say that uh, I guess in all my papers, I have thanks Alto Science IT because all my codes were running on uh, Triton. And, and I guess that was a huge thing for us because Like we never cared how good our personal like computer is because we were always like SSHing or like basically running something on Triton and and it was very easy to do so. And uh, on top of that, you also have maintained or developed some more user friendly. So so for people who don't know Triton, so there are two ways you can use Triton. Either like uh, a typical programmer you SSH to a server through command line black and Yeah. white to do the job. Or there is like a Jupyter hub on that, right? So you can Yeah. like open a Jupyter notebook Yeah. or whatever, or other like I can it it also supports MATLAB and it also supports different sorts of things, and you Yeah. can do it in a very easy way, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, let's see. So the interfaces. So Yeah. how did these come about? So like you say, there's the classic SSH to the computer cluster, which of course we support and will probably always support because that's the most basic and most powerful way to do anything. I don't remember when was it. So maybe, well, I guess it would have been 2017 plus or minus one year. Mm -hmm. I got to thinking when supporting um, people, you know, desktop Linux is much more usable than it used to be, Mm say, 20 years ago. I mean, we expect things to just work, like almost any task you need to do. Like you can, um, well, certainly do all the work on the computer, but even things like network mounting data on other servers is really easy. SSH, SSH key is really easy. So I was sort of thinking, what would a high-performance computing cluster look like it, if it was designed now instead of 20 years ago? Because it basically hasn't changed. Um, and somewhere from there, the idea of the Jupyter Hub came up. I mean, Jupyter is something that, of course, many people use. Um, and... Okay, so I don't remember exactly where it came, but basically the idea was usability. So if we do this, then more people are able to use the cluster and um, do their work. And my hope was not that it would be a replacement for the traditional cluster, but a stepping stone. So instead of having your own computer here, which is relatively easy and straightforward to use, and the cluster here, which is very hard, you have something in the middle, which is part of the cluster, but a smaller step from what you're used to. And then the next step to the cluster would be easier.
So, yeah, but anyway, we set that up and it worked pretty well. Mm -hmm. And, well, it's evolved over time. Now we don't run Jupyter Hub, but you can get Jupyter notebooks from the open on demand mm -hmm. service. I mean, it's the same idea. Yeah, um, yeah. All thinking of ways to make things more usable. Yeah, I guess one of these, uh, I don't know how, how, like how you agree it, but I know that a lot of courses at Alto, which needs uh, computational power, mm -hmm. they have homeworks which are basically built yeah. in that Jupyter Hub. So for example, mm -hmm. uh, we had a course called Complex Networks and uh, people had to, well, all the assignments were that you should open a Jupyter Notebook and there were chunks of code that yeah. were, you had to fill and then press. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so many other courses that they need this type of thing, they would just like talk to you and then you can design uh, an environment for people that even if yeah. someone does not have a good computer, they can just like open it mm -hmm. online, and just like run everything. And yeah. the teacher and the students and everyone would be happy. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and this is not so like... I, I should clarify, there's two different, or there were two different Jupyter Hubs at Alto. One was on Triton, which was for research and computing. Mm -hmm. One was run within the computer science department, and it was for teaching. Mm -hmm. They're both Jupyter Hub, like different data. They both use Alto accounts. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I was actually thinking, I'm pretty sure the Triton one came first, but Mm -hmm. Now I'm a bit doubting my own memory there, but anyway. But uh, you are also yeah. responsible for the correct yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, not just me yeah, um, yeah. anymore, yeah. or even at the start, but yeah, mm -hmm. I sort of connect them together. Okay, so now, so yeah, so if you are at Alto or if you are affiliated with Alto, you will always have access to Triton. Yeah. and other services that like uh, oh. you can have. But I believe- can I, can I add one more thing? So you say if you're at Alto. So this is a good point I thought of before. So anyone in Finland and really any university, you'll always be able to have access to some computing cluster. So let's say you're at some other Finnish university. Mm -hmm. Let, let's say Alto didn't have Triton. Anyone could go to CSC and apply for account there and use the CSC computers for their work. Um, and these are actually much larger than Triton and all that. But the real benefit of having it at Alto is the lower barrier to things. You don't have to apply for a separate account. It's the Alto account. You don't have to know this other access thing. You don't have to transfer all your data there, do calculations and transfer back. For example, by having it in-house, we had extra um, features like if you had a powerful workstation on your desk at work mm -hmm. then you could directly access the triton data because it was mounted onto that computer so basically it becomes one seamless large package much bigger than the sum of the parts so we have people who come and say okay i'd like to use csc and then it becomes a big thing transferring all the data using everything by ssh transferring it back i mean for an experienced person this is not hard but for a typical person, it's really just a lot more stuff, like a lot more steps to use. So that's the real benefit here. For the Alto cluster, you don't have to apply separately for each project to do some calculations and then vacate all the resources once your time is up. It's a continuous presence throughout your whole research. Yeah, that is indeed very true. Like, when I was at my workstation at my office, there, like it was feeling that your computer is actually like completely not a normal computer because mm -hmm. it was so melted you couldn't even notice you're doing something locally on your machine or like on something much more powerful and yeah the whole point is like that an average scientist is not familiar with all of these technicalities and either mm -hmm. too, or too lazy yeah. to learn all of this and they believe yeah. it yeah but it is not but when you make these things easier then mm -hmm. the average yeah. everyone gains a lot i, I mean I, I should say this a lot and a lot that how enjoyable is doing research at Alto because of those facilities. Mm -hmm. But it is not just because of that that we have good infrastructure and it's like melted and easy. I would say the main reason that you enjoy doing research at Alto 
is because of your second role as organizing a lot of teaching. Like mm. we have a lot of, of course, like official courses at Alto at different schools, yeah. but you separately organize you and when I say you, I mean you and your team. Yeah, our team. Yeah. So you have uh, crash courses on different topics, very to the point and very finely designed for people mm. who are not like that. They don't know nothing, nothing, but they know something, but they are yet not experts. They are not professional. So they can always like, and this is not just like some videos. There are like training and conversations and mm -hmm. exercise sets and too many good documentations that you have made. And I I want you to like tell me where this idea came from, who supported mm -hmm. it, and how it is going. Yeah, I guess there's two questions here. The basic courses and our current style of teaching online. Maybe yeah. I can give you some history because actually you joined right about the time we started teaching online because yeah. of some big event that happened in 2020. Yeah. Okay. So in 2019 and earlier, all of our courses were in person in some lecture hall. You could come to the course and there'd be someone there teaching alone. Like there'd be other helpers there, but be one person teaching at a time. And then you could follow along with your own computers. The person would be doing demos and there'd be time where people could do things and we'd walk around and help people. But all in all, it was a pretty typical course kind of arrangement. Yeah, typical um, classroom experience yeah. with no grading, of course. Yeah. And for here, we still had twice a year a high performance computing kickstart course, which was sort of our flagship course, so to say. It's where we taught the basics of using the cluster. And this lasted in the winters half a day and in the summers two days, something okay. like that. Um, by then we also had these code refinery courses, which were not about the high performance computing part, but basically about version control and other lightweight software development tools, which are needed to do minimum management of research code. Mm -hmm. And there were other advanced courses sprinkled in there. Also in person, um, a few, like taking a few days for a week, something like that. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess like, uh, I remember there were the, like, there are these courses like how to use Linux terminal, how to do mm -hmm. this and how to do that. Uh, I, I don't know how to do Python in a more efficient way, how to you yeah. and uh, the experience of people I remember was so delightful because we were from so many different backgrounds mm -hmm. and we were never treated like this because it's always hard that uh, you find the proper like difficulty level and you have like, mm -hmm. good connections to the teacher and and yeah. help you to learn and uh, basically finally use these things in your research uh, yeah but but what is really important about this is that and I, I i don't know maybe it's for people who make these policies is like that there are some fancy institute that they pay a lot of money and they have good infrastructures they have servers like computationally they have the hardware but because they have these facilitators like people who teach properly and mm -hmm. like basically build very yeah. user-friendly documentation they cannot get the best out of all the money they have spent yeah. but i believe like at alto we are kind of giving this luxury to every individual mm -hmm. that can really get access yeah. to what alto has like paid for, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This is like something that is missing in so many places. Mm -hmm. So do you mean like the accessibility and that everyone can attend without? Yeah, yeah. For example, you have a website, Research Software Engineers, mm -hmm. that it includes a lot of good documentations and a lot of links and a lot of uh, how to do the stuff. You have your crash courses, you have your garage, so you really yeah. let people use the things that they were supposed mm -hmm. to without going to like a lot of headaches. Yeah. And do you know like Maybe. 
Yeah. Yeah, maybe, yeah. So sort of following up or related to this, so how can everyone attend our courses? Maybe I can say what the mm -hmm. current practices for our biggest courses are. So yeah. it took about a year to get here. We piloted it with different code refinery courses on our HPC Kickstart course. But now our courses are big. Well, as before, there might be like 30 people would be a, a large attendance. Now, if it's less than 100, I consider it a small attendance. And we've had multiple hundreds. So our courses are live streamed on Twitch. Mm -hmm. um, the site doesn't really matter. Twitch just happens to work. But the point is that anyone in the world can tune in and watch without taking any extra resources for us. So it's all there. Mm -hmm. um, the learners aren't in a Zoom room, so there's no chance of the learners getting their video or audio recorded. Mm -hmm. Instead of expecting learners to interact, we have co-teaching. So we have two people, two instructors teaching every course. So basically the course is a conversation between these two people as they, like one might teach it to the other with you know, 400 other people watching, something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we have a written document called our notes document where people can write questions and we have a bunch of people that are answering the questions all at the same time. So a typical course would have several hundred people or, well, could have hundreds of questions being asked during a three hour session, something mm -hmm. like that. It's really kind of amazing. But all this together also means that we can rec put the recordings online very quickly with minimum extra processing. Mm -hmm. So this really means that anyone who wants to attend really can. You don't have to take your time out of the day and be able to attend lecture hall each day. If you can't make it right, then the videos are available. Mm -hmm. um, these kinds of things. Yeah, but so, I you used to also have, like you organize some courses with other Nordic universities. And it's yes, well. yeah. Yeah. So then since we're doing it online like this, there's no real limit to the attendance. So we really can have all of these other universities take part. So many of our courses are combinations between um, staff at similar kinds of teams in at least Finland, Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, mm -hmm. and occasionally a bit more. Mm -hmm. And this could be a whole other video and yeah, topic yeah, yeah. of conversation, okay. but yeah, so, something that I remember that a very nice thing at Alto is that supposedly you like let's say you're a researcher and you want to do a project like the same that you did with this mm -hmm. core project, and you are just a researcher and you want to conduct something and you have no clue what to do it, mm -hmm. and this is another luxury that you come and talk with a scientist, uh, yeah, and okay, tell tell me about some of projects like that, because it was a very nice thing that people everywhere yeah. in the world would be very glad to have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, let's talk about the research software engineer team. Yeah. So the history here was I first, I think I first learned the term sometime in 2018 mm -hmm. and it took a little while until I learned what it actually meant. Um, and then I realized it's what we needed because it's what we're sort of already doing and what we need to do more of. So research software engineer is something that was invented around 2012, I think. Um, basically, it's someone that bridges the gap between the research and the technology and the software programming, stuff like that. So basically, well, I guess there's many ways to say it, but you know, expecting a new PhD student to write good maintainable software that will still have value in five years is a really big thing to ask. And maybe academics need another professional role to handle this kind of thing. Sort of like a laboratory manager, but for software. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, a lot of work happened. And eventually in 2020, we created a research software engin engineer team within science IT. So we're basically all the same team, but uh, sort of a new brand name for what we do there. And our goal, I think I said this before, we don't support the computers, but we support the research. And this means we support the people and people have different needs. 
as opposed to computers, which are all the same, basically. So someone can come by to our team. Usually it happens by dropping into our daily support garage session. It's every day at one o'clock, people can drop by, let's say people at Alter University, not anyone in the world, and drop by and ask us any kind of questions about scientific computing. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes these are short things like how do I do X or Y? We can share the screen, we can answer right away. But a lot of projects become bigger. I would like to do a um, RAG enhanced LLM search for this or that, or I need a platform made for this kind of data collection study, or hey, thy previous PhD student had written this software and I need to use it now, but it doesn't work anymore. Can you take a look and figure out how to get it installed right now? Mm -hmm. um, and these are all things that become a bigger RSD project where one of our research engineers will go, will take it upon themselves. They'll follow it through until it's done enough that the academic researcher can um, use it for their purposes and take it over again. Did yeah. this describe what we do pretty yeah. well? Yeah, well, um, I mean, at least from a user experience, it sounds like what you have, but... Yeah. Um, then then this is like something very really interesting that uh, you have made uh, so you have like made the standards so high mm -hmm. that i'm not sure how easy it is for other places to mm -hmm. to follow you as a model and mm -hmm. replicate what you have done at their institute are you yeah. willing to share your experiences or are you looking forward to seeing people talking to them and like letting them uh, use your experiencing experiences to build such a nice environment of yeah. hardware, software, and people. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to share like what we've done, our stories and so on. I mean, in some ways, everything needs to be adapted to its own institution. Mm -hmm. But I mean, most of our reports, plans, and so on mm -hmm. are available on online somewhere, mostly from our site. Um, and that's a good starting point. But if someone like in the very big picture, if you wanted to make this kind of thing, I'd say first you have to decide you actually want to. So decide that you will provide enough support so that not every academic researcher has to know everything themselves about computing. Basically admitting that technology is so complex, you need a bigger team here to do things. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably the hardest step because many people will say, well, researchers know how to do everything and if they don't, they can learn. Well, yeah, but have you ever met a academic that says they have time to do new things? Not mm -hmm. really. Um, and I think in our case, it worked really well taking the existing team that sort of had the good connections and then slowly expanded its um, its mission wider and wider. So, you know, slowly um, start with basic, like more basic cluster support over time. We start hiring dedicated people. Once you have the dedicated people, they take all of their time and support people. And once um, the researchers learn this is available, you start getting more and more drop-ins and it mm -hmm. never ends, basically. So in a, in a more practical way, if, if like, let's say some other institute in either Finland or some other country, yeah. uh, they wanna, they listen to this conversation and look at mm -hmm. all of the beautiful things online. Yeah. They say, okay, we want to have like a science IT team mm -hmm. in either our department or in our university. Yeah. Uh, how should they proceed, do you think? Uh, like, how, mm. how do you think the guidelines should be? Yeah. It's like, what kind of guidelines? Like, how to... Yes, of course, it needs some money because you need to hire people, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I believe a lot of things that you are now doing are considered to be trivial for other universities and they don't really need 
they do not really see this need that mm -hmm. they see that people are suffering, but because a lot, everyone is suffering, they, they think that yeah. they make it better. Yeah. But now you have done this whole thing here that you can go and tell people, hey, you don't need to suffer. You spend yeah. a new amount of money mm -hmm. to do this mm -hmm. thing, to gather enough good people. And yeah. the whole department gains, every individual researcher gains. Yeah. We will be happy to get it. Maybe I could say one of the most motivating stories um, for starting this team, at least for me, was it happened before I joined Science IT. So mm -hmm. there was a PhD student in our group that I worked with. So I basically, like, they needed to analyze a bunch of data that already existed. So mm -hmm. I said, oh, you know, we can work together instead of writing all your own scripts to do the stuff, I can help you import it into an SQLite database and show you how to query it. And it might save you some time in the future because mm -hmm. you know, you're know, you not processing a bunch of CSV files from scratch, but it's a little mm -hmm. bit more structured. They didn't know the details of this, but thought it sounded okay. And I started doing this. I took a uh, few hours of my time one day to do the initial imports of the data and yeah. then we met up and i showed them uh so here's the database here's how you query it okay this is good what about this and that i went back and i improved the database added more data uh helped their needs and the next day we met again and i showed the updates and answered more questions about doing more advanced queries on it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. basically by the end of the week instead of taking a lot of time doing like writing a bunch of Python code to do something which basically already existed in database engines and basically doing it again when, you know, yeah, all yeah. the previous students had done it. They've mm -hmm. used best practices. Yeah, They were basically independent. Mm -hmm. And then they came back several months later and said, wow, this is amazing. If someone had taught me this whenever I began my PhD and helped me get started, I could have saved three months out of my PhD to date. And this is a time argument. So I took less than a week of my time to help yeah. someone with a project, not just sending links saying, here's this, but figure it out yourself. Mm -hmm. But it really is sort of a like bi-directional, I help you do this, you need this, I help I do a bit more, I help you answer it. I, I it's like a practical mentorship kind of thing. Yeah. Um, a week of my time could save someone else three months of their time. Mm -hmm. And given that time is the thing which academics most are in need of, this was actually a pretty good argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that is, but like if you want to convince like the dean of school of science yeah. in some other university, what what yeah. you what you said is very convincing for the user mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Side, but for yeah. people who are supposed to because in my opinion yeah. every school of science every engineering school they should have a unit some yeah, standards. yeah. Mm -hmm. and that's basically i mean it's not really a new concept for us but it came from this research software engineer yeah. idea like when the people started it in 2012 mm -hmm. that idea I mean, we're ba it's basically the extension of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, so for the management. So another anecdote that worked for our management sum was basically that you have a bunch of people. Some people have the background and experiences to get started with the cluster mm -hmm. right away. Some don't, and a lot of this comes from, is correlated with the demographic background. So basically, who were your friends before? And it's just um, increasing the inequalities we have. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, yeah, like I, I use an example for me. So I had a friend in high school that was into Linux and computers and stuff. I learned stuff from them. And that made me slightly better at that. And it just has continued on through time. The mm -hmm. people that didn't have that chance are um, mm -hmm. probably a lot more time. So basically, this sort of improving equality and equity argument mm. um, because we will help the people that most need help actually did resonate with our management quite a bit.
Uh, that that I can really relate because I personally have always seen that that a lot of people who are bad are it's not because of it's not their fault they just Yeah. have no I mean, let's not say bad, but just um, inexperienced and don't don't have like someone that showed them this. I really think that most computing is learned like um, by mentoring from friends, things like that. Exactly. And when people don't have time to mentor each other in their group, Yeah. it's really hard to learn these things. Especially at least our generation that we started from having no computers and then having computers in science. It is kind of quite a new thing if you look at the whole, Mm -hmm. like the whole science from near Yeah. time to now. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I'm not going to like take more Yeah. of your time. Just I have two more questions. But uh, I, I think there is maybe a bit more I can say about this. So yes, it is hard. Like, I mean, we really have to give a lot of credit to our management for saying this is something that we need and it's worth taking a risk on. It really helped that we already had the science IT team around. So basically it um, like it was a natural extension of what we were doing. If you came and said you needed this from scratch, it might be a lot harder to do it. So maybe just finding the closest thing you have and giving them a larger mission might help, but it's a very much of a mindset kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree Yeah, okay. but now that you're thinking what has been like your biggest challenge in doing all of these things Hmm. what has annoyed you the most or what was like really tricky to figure out I mean, there's certainly been a lot that's been Mm -hmm. difficult and um, talking to people, but, you know, you expect things to be slow and hard and when talking to management, Mm -hmm. you know, needing to find the right um, way to express things and so on. Um, hmm. Hmm. Let me come back to this question at the end. Maybe I can think of something, but Yeah. there's... And mm -hmm. Um, I have some ideas here, but I really want to make sure I can, yeah, let's come back to it. okay. And and how do you see the future? Where where is science IT going? What are your plans and Yeah. Hmm. what are the things that you are looking for? So I think one of our biggest challenges right now is the scaling and expanding. So now the... dedicated research software engineering team is five people, soon to be six, or no, actually it's six people, soon to be seven people. And we need to figure out how big it should be and how it will continue to grow. So we're based in one of the schools at Alto, but our needs are across basically everyone. And I think one of the things we'll need to investigate is how to extend this to other schools. So do we basically um, like replicate our team? Mm So hmm say there's the School of Engineering, Research Software Engineer team, the School of Chemical Engineering, Research Software Engineer team, the School of Science, Research Software Engineer team, and so on. Or do we expand more in place how we are? How do we get these other Um, schools invested in what we're doing because um, it would be good if their management was interested in the kind of things we've got here. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, cool. Uh, I believe like uh, for people who have been at uh, computer science department of Alto University, uh, on the second floor, there is a little museum of computers that you can Mm see old -hmm. machines to the new ones and you can see how generations by generations of uh, computers have evolved through. And one day we had this discussion with a friend about What about software? If we were supposed to have a museum of softwares, what will we have there? And it was a very tricky question because Mm like, -hmm. <laughs> yeah. like asking me as a theoretical physicist that if you want to have a museum of theoretical physics idea, what would you have there? But 
I don't know that answer yet. What I know is Yeah. that if I would be very happy as an auto employee to have a map of the evolution of science IT project next to that little museum of computers in, in the computer science department because it shows that not only how Mm -hmm. machines Mm have evolved, but also how people using the machine yeah have evolved mm -hmm. got together to make the best out of that. yeah And that's actually it. Mm -hmm. i've started writing a history of the alto rsc team and there's a separate page which i'll work on that's the history of the science it team which I've thought is important just because, well, history is what binds us together. And we have so many new people. If you don't know where we came from, it can be Yeah. hard to. Um, And one I of them is almost done, but I will send them to you when it's ready. And I guess it can be added as a link in these descriptions here. Yeah, that Um, would be great. I, I believe the story of how we close the barrier between researchers and software engineers, like this is like one of the maybe trickiest tasks of today's academia, because the, the companies don't care about this, but this is only on the shoulders of universities and the whole academic system to push people to the extent they can so they can basically write good codes and assemble everything together. Great, great. Uh, I guess we had a very nice conversation. I would like to thank you and your team, every single people Yeah. there. But so your last question or your second last question, what's the most challenging thing? Yeah. And maybe I'd say it's not only technical, but expressing this mindset that not everyone has to know everything these days. Science is not just a like, okay, let someone struggle for four or five years and eventually they'll learn enough to get some papers out. But that... things are so complex, it computational research needs to be a team process. And there's people that immediately see this and say, good idea. There's certainly some people that say, well, no, just hire better people to do this kind of work. And I think they're sort of missing some of the Mm -hmm. idea here, which is that, you know, not everyone can dedicate their life to looking at the computer side. And eventually you get where all your time would be spent learning just about the technology to get your advanced projects done and you don't have time to do the work itself. To say nothing about things like, you know, we say computing should be everywhere, AI should be everywhere, this kind of stuff. But you can't expect everyone to become a computer science, I mean, computer science is in the right term, a scientific computing student and spend years of their time doing that. There, they have enough to do with their own fields. And just getting, like, finding the right way to express this mindset. I still don't have something that works for everyone. It's, the message really has to be tailored to everyone I talk to in order to help them to see this. At least I can say for now, within the School of Science here at Alto University, the management knows this. Most of our users knows this. Our Uh, group leaders tend to know this, and I think it would be really hard for them to go back any other way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But don't under, under, underestimate the difficulty of coming up with the right message for this. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. I can see it's just, I mean, it if it was an easy job, it was done. Yeah, Like <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. that's that's how there is this delicate art of doing this type of thing. I know. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, I guess it's time to wrap up. So we talk about people, we talk about facilities and all of the things. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Hmm. I guess for follow-ups, so who do you expect to be the audience here? I guess it's people, um, scientists and other Uh, mostly scientists scientific leaders. and anyone who is doing scientific research with computational Yeah. tools. And of Yeah. course, managers and other Mm -hmm. Mm people who are trying to have a better -hmm. Yeah. environment for the employee. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say it's, um, My overall message is don't go alone. So um, everywhere in the world, but especially in academia, there's this idea that we need to reinvent something novel in order to 
get credit for it. But there's a lot of good practices out there. And it's better if you work together and make something larger than the parts. And then we can um, yeah, work together, like join our courses, join um, join our the idea of our team. I can't, I can't really say join our RSC team because we're just at Alto, but you know, let's work together and share knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't go alone. That's a good tagline for a lot of people. And do not reinvent the wheel. That that's very good. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Richard. Okay. Uh, say my hi to all your team members and okay. thank you, Alto University. Will do. Have a nice day. I wish okay. you all the days to come. Yeah, thanks so much. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.